and good evening. That's a hot mic right there. Good evening, everybody. Who's feeling good out there? Hey, it's, uh, it's March, so that you guys must be Port St. Lucky's out there. It's, it's Monday evening, and I'm in the habit of calling meetings to order Monday nights at City Council meeting. So hereby I call this Crosstown Extension Construction Public Meeting to Order. And what an auspicious occasion it is, four score and seven years ago. Now, it wasn't four score, but it was two score. Forty years ago, the city of Port St. Lucie first put down the idea of a third east-west crossing, third crossing over the river. I heard a cheese or maybe a cheese out there, an expression. It was really that long ago. It was in the 1980 comprehensive plan. That's when we first started talking about it. And so here we are 37 years later. A disaster at rush hour. We need that third river crossing. It's just long overdue with a population base in this city. I think it's great. I think it's long overdue. And uh, looking forward to being able to move traffic much, much easier um, on Port St. Lucie Boulevard. After many, many challenges, getting ready to talk about construction that will take more or less 800 days. Where's Patricia Roebling at? Patricia, what's 365 times two? 730, everybody, 730. That's all we should push them for. Now, we, we got here thanks to a lot of hard work from you and a team. And I didn't get to see every, this is a big room. It's a lot of people here. So there were many, many councils that have been involved, many, many citizens. Where is, is our current vice mayor, Shannon Martin, here? I, I see Councilwoman Stephanie Morgan back there. I saw uh, Dr. Councilman Dr. John Carvelli. There he is back there. Uh, let's see. Any other current council members here? Just want to acknowledge them and, and thank them. All right. Patricia, you don't have a list of dignitaries or anything, do you, that I should recognize? I don't want to get in trouble. You always get in trouble do doing this, this part of the meeting. No. Oh, county commissioner and, and retired vice mayor Linda Bartz is here. She's been working on this project a, a long time. Give her a round of applause and our council a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so in addition to having it in the comp plan back in 19, 1980, uh, another milestone that I, I just want to point out, because how many people here really love taxes? Anybody just love taxes in this room? No, we've had a couple tea parties about taxes. We don't like taxes, but the people of Port St. Lucie wanted this project so badly. Because I want the parkway to be built because traffic on US-1 is terrible, <laughs> especially at rush hour. Because I live off Primo Vista and that road is so crowded at times. So I'm glad to see the Crosstown Parkway. That 12 years ago already, the voters of Port St. Lucie came out, 89% of voters said, we need this project so bad, tax us. Please tax us so we can get this project. So how many times do you see 89% of voters agree on anything in this day and age? And how many times do you see them to say tax us to get this done? So that's how badly this community wants to get it done. I've often reflected on Crosstown as being a referendum on our character as a community. If we're going to be a winning community, if we're going to be that shining city on a hill, we cannot try to do something for 40 years and not get it done. So over the last 11 years, we've gone through a $5 million federal process to give us our current route. And that route has been challenged three times. Because I think that there's a better place that the bridge can go. Okay. It doesn't need to go through the preserve and everything. Okay. Uh, because of all the you know, fish that that's the only place they spawn, uh -huh. uh, and I guess there's two other places that they could put the bridge that is less expensive. Once an appeal and then an administrative challenge, and we've prevailed, and here we are at the doorstep. Hopefully, later this month, we're going to get the, crop, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers permit, then the U.S. Coast Guard permit and we will have everything we need. But we already have everything we need to actually initiate construction. And as many of you probably know, we've started construction activities 
So things are happening and things will continue to happen. And that's what tonight's all about. So with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our, to our project team. And thank you everybody for being here tonight. We look forward to your comments and we're looking forward to getting her done. up here for a second. I just want to introduce, I didn't introduce our venerable city manager, Russ, Bla Russ Gitter Dumb Blackburn. Give him a round of applause. I'm sure he knows what 365 times two is. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your opening remarks, and we really appreciate your attendance today and, of course, the support of the project. Uh, we have a 30-minute, 30 30, roughly 30-minute 30 presentation today for you discussing the features of the project. At the end of the presentation, we're going to allow for some question and answer. Uh, there are some speaker cards in the back of the room, so if you haven't already, please fill them out. My name is Randy Scott. I'm with Target Engineering Group, and we are the construction management team hired by the city of Port St. Lucie to manage the team and represent the city. Also with me today, and I'll, I'll introduce just the folks up here, also with me today and on part of my team is George Denty, Beth Zoko, and along with that, we have the uh, contractors uh, group here. And Chris Brown is with Archer Western. He's representing the contractors group. And Rachel Bach, she is the design project manager. And then we have a couple city folks up here helping us out today. Patricia Roebling, assistant city manager. And Frank Knott. So this is uh, an overall view of the project. Uh, the limits of the project are from Sandia to US-1, um, and it's going to touch down where US-1 intersects Village Green is where the project will meet US-1. Some scope items, uh, of course, we're taking the two-lane West Virginia and making it into a six-lane corridor, very similar to the rest of Crosstown Parkway. Uh, we are also going to have some major drainage improvements, water sewer upgrades, sidewalks, landscaping, lighting, and new signals. Uh, this project will provide the third east-west crossing over the St. Lucie River, and it'll connect I-95 to US-1. I know we're all really looking forward to it to relieve all that congestion on Port St. Lucie Boulevard. This is a uh, cross-section of what it'll look like, and again, it's very similar to the rest of the corridor. Um, as I mentioned, six lanes of traffic, three in each direction. We'll have uh, bike lanes in each direction. So now the bike lanes will extend all the way from west of 95 to US-1. Uh, we'll have sidewalks, pedestrian lighting. Um, on the outside of the sidewalks, we'll have some landscape berms. Um, and then we'll have chain link fence on the outside of that along the property lines. Some additional uh, project enhancements are linear park, as I mentioned, uh, with meandering sidewalks through it. Uh, along the sidewalk, we'll have 10 exercise stations uh, for those in, in need of some fitness, and we'll also have some water fountains. The sidewalk will go around the lake here that you see at Floresta and Crosstown, providing a nice environment. Um, and then we'll have, again, pedestrian uh, lighting along the sidewalk. <clears throat> Some additional enhancements. It's what we call the Coral Street, Coral Reef Street Trailhead. It'll be west of the river, adjacent to Coral Reef Street, underneath the bridge. It'll feature a small parking lot for neighborhood access. And the neighbors can access the Coral Reef Trailhead, which will be an access to the sidewalk along the Crosstown Parkway, as well as there'll be a small dock and another canoe launch, this one being on the west side of the river. Some bridge aesthetics. This being a very significant project, 
as the mayor mentioned, and a special project to the city of Port St. Lucie. We want to add several aesthetics uh, to feature the project. At the four corners of the bridge, you're going to see a concrete pedestal like this, and at the top of the pedestal, there'll be a fish sculpture. Uh, this fish sculpture, by the way, was voted on by the people and approved by city council as a result of the last design uh, public meeting just several months ago. Uh, and right below the fish sculpture, the pedestals will be wrapped in a mosaic tile mural uh, that was designed by Guy Harvey exclusively for the city. We'll also have some nice bridge features. As I mentioned, the bike lanes. We'll have two bike lanes that will extend across the bridge all the way to US-1. <clears throat> we'll also have two pedestrian overlooks at the center of the bridge. They're going to be uh, mid-span of the bridge over the fork of the river. And uh, they'll have benches like you see here for folks to sit down and just enjoy the environment. Uh, the sidewalks will have decorative railing and we'll also have LED lighting strips in the barrier wall to help light people at night if they're walking over the bridge at nighttime. And we really think that the uh, bridge is going to become a pedestrian, pedestrian and runner's destination. Uh, when we're done, we'll have two mile round trip of beautiful views from the bridge. So it's going to be real nice. And this slide just shows the uh, intersection of US-1 where we touch down. <clears throat> We're going to make several improvements. We're going to have uh, pedestrian refuge islands on all four corners to allow pedestrians across much safer. We're going to upgrade the signals. We're going to provide uh, multiple turn lanes if you're heading west on Crosstown. Uh, there'll be three left-hand turn lanes and two right-hand turn lanes. Or, yeah. And last, what I'm sure you're all interested in is the schedule. Uh, the, the schedule, as you know, we've already started construction. Uh, right now, we're scheduled to be complete in the fall of 2019. And of course, that's pending the additional um, permit things that we have to get done. We broke uh, just this slide down into four key segments um, that you'd be interested in, math to coral reef which is the west side roadway. Uh, we expect that to be complete, as I mentioned, we're working on it now, and it should be complete July 2019. The bridge construction, uh, we expect to start that in May, and George is going to go over um, some of the uh, what to expect during bridge construction. But we expect that to start in May, and it will be complete in October of 2019, and that's really driving our schedule. US-1 Village Green, uh, we're going to start that around fall of 2017, and that will be complete April 2019. And last, the purple line you see on the bottom, that's the Floresta intersection. We're going to build most of the intersection over the summer of 2017. Of course, it won't be fully functional until the project's complete in late 2019. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to George, and he's going to discuss what to expect during bridge construction. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate your support, and I'm proud to be part of this job. We'll build a monument to Port St. Lucie. I'm going to talk a little about the major bridge components. This is my favorite part of the job, of course and get you an idea of the magnitude of this work, the size of the bridge, the size of the equipment, the numbers of cubic yards of concrete, and some of the impacts that you might expect. And I'm trying not to sugarcoat them, so nobody's surprised when you notice that we're building a major bridge out there. Yeah, yeah. I had to come to the Civic Center the other day uh, for the Italian Fest, and it just made no sense to go wide either one way or the other to get there when I could have just gone straight out cross town. Trestle. We're building a trestle, which is a temporary bridge in itself. The trestle will be put in adjacent to the location of the new bridge. 
This trestle is going to pro provide us a platform for delivering materials, equipment, uh, personnel to the bridge site, and it'll allow us to build this major bridge with not putting any major equipment on the ground. We're able to reach over, build the bridge. When we're done with that, we're going to take and take the trestle apart as we back out. It'll be like we're never there. Uh, the trestle provides an environmentally uh, sensitive uh, opportunity to build the bridge from the top down. It also provides a very safe and efficient way to put together a bridge. You're not up in the air. You're not on a barge. You're on a safe platform. And interestingly enough, this trestle has a greater capacity than the bridge itself. Remember, this thing has to support major equipment and materials. So it is robust. I like to tell people that if this were a third world country, they would paint this thing and call it a bridge. Installation. The trestle will be built by driving pipe pile into the ground. Those pipe pile will extend somewhere around 80 foot into the ground so we get the capacity needs of the trestle. That driving those pile will be fairly loud and I'm, uh, that impact will be felt, especially on the West Bank. The West Bank folks will be hearing us drive in pile, and that ring, I call it the heartbeat of Port St. Lucie, is success. It's telling you that we're working. By the way, the ordinance, the noise ordinance in Port St. Lucie allows for working from 7 a.m. to sundown. Well, we thought that was a bit too liberal, so this contract has a restriction that we cannot drive pile till 8 a.m., we have to stop at 5 p.m. We will not work on holidays. We will not work on weekends to try to respect some of your quiet time because you're going to be mad at enough at us when we're working during the week. As we progress, by the way, and get away from the West Bank, it'll get quieter and quieter. That's the wrong way. Impacts, once again, that driving of those pipe pile will be a resounding ring. Environmental value, by the way, this was a permit requirement. The permitting agency said that they don't want us clowning around down there in, in the sensitive areas. So we had to come up with a top-down type of affair. This solved the problem. It's cost-effective. And like I said, when we leave from our temporary easement, We'll pull that trestle up with us and it'll go home with the contractor. One of the major components and one of the first things we're going to do is drive piling. Concrete pre-stressed piling. These will be 30-inch square piling. We don't know the length yet because we go through a test program to determine what length we need for the capacities of the bridge. Our best guess at this point, we're in the neighborhood of 80-foot long piling. The minimum tips or the amount they'll be in the ground is somewhere around minus 65. We have a test pile program that will help us refine those so we know exactly what each one of those piles will carry. It's your foundation, your backbone. Pile installation. We drive pile one by one. A crane picks up a pile driving hammer. That hammer is massive. It uses a combination of gravity and a diesel explosion to accomplish driving that 30-inch pile into the ground. And, and remember, we're talking about dry, driving uh, 40 or 50 foot of this. So that, that will certainly have an impact. We monitor these. Nowadays, we've become pretty sophisticated in the monitoring a pile and the setting of pile lengths. We use a pile driving analyzer that's hooked up to the piling, monitor each blow, and we're able to tell how much load that pile can carry, how deep it is, and if we've done any damage to the pile. We've become very sophisticated in pile, and it's made for a more efficient project. We used to, back in the day, we overdrove pile. We had pile that was longer than necessary. We now are using uh, uh, techniques that will minimize those costs and impacts. Ooh. Pile driving video. I want to show you just a bit of what you could expect, and you could hear the heartbeat of Port St. Lucie. Beth, hit it. A 
very heavy weight is lifted up via hydraulics and dropped at the same time a diesel explosion takes place. That energy or force drives the pile into the ground. And that's the lovely sound of pile driving. It sounds like victory to me sometimes. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is install a pier. This pier will be placed right on the edge of the coral reef waterway, and it will be cast. Uh, it'll look very similar to that, by the way. A pier is more of an aesthetic upright feature. We only have one of those, by the way. Once we leave the ground there, we're going to what's called a pile bent arrangement. They're a little more efficient and a little uh, less aesthetically pleasing. But remember, nobody's going to see the foundation of the bridge once we get out away from the waterway. Caps. The caps take the piling and encapsulate them and make it work as a unit. We'll be precasting them caps. In fact, we've started the process on site. This was poured Friday, our first structure. And we have the form set up right out there. We have the rebar cages set. And we'll be pouring three to five of these per week. Cap erection. They'll be just lifted in place. We fly them in with a crane. And then they'll be concreted in the proper position. Once again, precasting, a, a significant amount of the bridge will be precast, pre-stressed. That means that we've done it somewhere else besides right on the bridge itself. Precasting provides you several things. One, it's much more efficient. You could build things in a factory-like setting. Two, its quality is better because you're, able, you're not working up in the air. You're not working in unusual conditions. And it becomes more of a factory-like setting because of that quality, durability is increased. So you're going to get a robust feature. Next thing is the beams. The beams will be strung between caps. They span the bridge, so to speak. Now, these bands, as you can see, are giant. Our spans average about 145 feet, which is a significant span length. These beams are six foot high, pre-stressed beams. We will be uh, building 284 of those. These are built as pre-stressed off-site as well, up in a Vero Beach manufacturing facility, and they'll be carried down here one by one. Those will come on specialized trucks. They'll come down I-95, hit cross town and they'll head east. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll then put those in place via cranes. That's the erection process. Pretty tricky. Not very nice on a windy day, but very precise. You're talking about using a pair of 200 ton capacity cranes to set these things. Big stuff. Remember, that thing's six foot tall. Much taller than me, of course. No short jokes. Okay, there's uh, another beam. Once again, these are big pieces of concrete. And believe it or not, until they're in place, they're fairly delicate. They're really not meant to be manhandled, so they have to be transported, tied down, and picked up correctly, or else they crack terribly. Our quality control will assure that that doesn't happen. Decks. The decks are what you ride on. That's the riding surface. And we will be casting those in place. We have 31 spans. We'll be pouring 31 decks. And these are significant concrete pours. Figure this, 145-foot spans, average 115 foot wide, 8 and a half inches thick. You're talking about over 500 cubic yards of concrete per span. That's over 50 concrete mixers full to be able to accomplish a deck takes quite a while. These things will go somewhere between six and ten hours, depending on how efficient we are. And there's a lot of concrete to be poured. You've seen a concrete slab poured on a house? Well, picture 50 times that. We form the decks, by the way, by installing deck pans in between the beams that I showed you. Those are those metal pans you see. The next thing we do is install the rebar. Remember, concrete isn't that strong on its own intention, so we enhance its strength with uh, reinforcing steel. Reinforcing steel is a godsend in providing strength, but it's a curse in creating corrosion. 
The downfall of the majority of structures in Florida is as a result of premature corrosion of the rebar. And the big secret is getting adequate cover and consolidated high quality impermeable concrete. We've learned that formula. We, know, we now know through quality control how to provide you a robust bridge that's going to outlast you. These are 100-year bridges. And with the proper quality control, you should never see any repairs in your lifetime. The casting, again, we talked about the pouring of concrete, but picture, you've seen crews finishing a slab on a house. Well, picture the size of this. You just could not do it by hand, so we have machines that actually help spread the concrete and will actually help finish it. The finishing, it's called a Bidwell screed. It is fully automated, runs on rails. It helps distribute the concrete. It helps finish it. It assures us that we have the proper concrete thickness and we have that proper concrete cover. Curing, curing is paramount to concrete. The quicker it cures, the more apt it is to crack. Cracks lead to corrosion. Our job is to make sure we have a crack-free structure. In order to do that, there are curing criteria. Slow is better. When we finish a deck, we immediately spray it with a membrane curing compound. Then we cover it with these polyethylene covered burlap wettened blankets and keep those blankets in place for 72 hours. We don't want any cracks in the deck or else you wind up replacing decks as you might see on I-95 as you drive through the area. Those premature deck failures are as a result of reinforcing steel issues. Ain't gonna happen here. The deck impacts, well, frankly, what you're gonna hear is a lot of backup alarms when you're hearing all these concrete trucks coming. Once again, most of it's gonna occur from west to east. As we move forward, it won't be long before you won't hear us again. We also will be pouring these very late in the afternoon, extending into the night. There are several reasons for that. Pouring concrete, it needs to be a cool, windless type of environment to prevent the cracking. Secondly, imagine trying to get 50 concrete trucks timed and on the job and stuck in traffic on US-1. It just doesn't work. The continuity of delivery is important. Nobody's out there at night except for some of the bartenders and the like. So the reality is that nighttime is a good time. It's not good for your social life or your family life, but we got to get it done. Next, what we found over the years is that we finish these bridges and people don't like the way they ride. You know, that boom, 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 boom. We spend a lot of money on these and figure, well, we should be able to provide a smooth bridge. In order to do that, we've come up with a process called planing. This planing is actually takes and longitudinally grinds the deck using a profilograph and some other computer generated equipment to provide you a ride that's going to be better than the adjacent asphalt roads that lead up to it. Next thing we do is grooving, and that's a Young Rascal song, by the way, but this is more of a uh, process where we transversely groove the bridge. These are engineered depth grooves, and what they do is they provide extra friction traction to you. They enhance the water runoff so you don't get the uh, hydroplaning that you might expect on a slick concrete road. So, we plane longitudinally, we groove transversely. As you can see, there's a sample of the grooving over there. It's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, uh, we know, you heard the mayor, he keeps talking about this 24 month, two times 365 thing. So I thought I'd throw this in because this is how I'd like it to turn out. Beth? It takes a lot of Cuban coffee to get your crew working like this, by the way. And just remember, when you're ready to complain, you'll wake up the next day and the bridge will be done. By the way, this is an earth cam. We're talking to the city about installing one of these where we'll have live video cam going. And also you'll get one of these cool videos at the end that shows how quick we can actually build the job. With that being said, I think I'm gonna turn it over to the 
design project manager, Rachel Bach. They are the design build team designers of record. And uh, take it away, Rachel. Good evening. As George said, I'm Rachel Bach. I'm the design project manager with RSNH. We've been teamed with Archer Western on this project. Um, and actually, including the proposal phase, we've been working on this project for three years. So we know a lot about this corridor. And I've been asked to explain a little bit about the intersection at Floresta Drive and Crosstown Parkway, which I've had lots of questions from some of you folks tonight about, and I'm sure you're very interested to hear about it. You know, we're really looking forward to it, except we, doesn't, we don't like that super street intersection at Floresta. That's the only thing we don't like about it. Okay. So I wanted to see what they had to say about that tonight. So I wanted to see if they had done anything to revise that. That turnaround superhighway will back traffic up, you know, 10, 10 cars in the morning and there's no, there's only space for five so and I am very concerned about the intersection of Floresta and Crosstown that intersection should be just like all the other intersections on the Crosstown when people are going south on Floresta they will have to cross over three lanes of traffic on the Crosstown make a u-turn cross over three lanes of traffic to continue going south on Floresta. Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. You've probably, most of you heard about the Super Street intersection that we have proposed and that's been approved for this project. A Super Street is defined by, Florida, by Federal Highway Association as a restricted crossing U-turn. It works basically like a a stretched out signalized roundabout um, it's more efficient for the traffic that we have here it reduces compared to a traditional intersection it reduces the signal phasing from four to three phases the u-turns are signalized and synchronized to continue the flow of traffic the intersection will be clearly signed and striped and the super street has been proven effective in reducing travel time and delay and it increases safety by redu reducing conflict points at major crossovers. So we have several slides here that explain the phasing of the signals for the Super Street. The first phase shows the Crosstown Parkway left turns and Floresta right turns. So at this, at this phase, the, uh, the traffic is going through at the U-turns, but everyone can turn left from Crosstown onto Floresta and can turn right from Floresta onto Crosstown. The second phase stops the traffic going through at Crosstown going left. It goes right at Floresta still and continues to the signalized U-turns. So the Crosstown traffic at the U-turns has a red light and so that the U-turns can take place safely. And then the third phase is to have the through movement of Crosstown Parkway. And actually, let me go back to the, the second phase. Um, it's important to note that at, during the second phase when Floresta is turning right, the pedestrians can cr safely cross Crosstown Parkway because those will all have red lights. And then during the third phase, the through movement of Crosstown Parkway continues. And during that phase is when pedestrians can cross Floresta Drive. For the Super Street, the conflict points are reduced from 32 to 14. That's a 56% reduction in conflict points in the intersection compared to a traditional four-leg intersection. This results in fewer crashes and less severe crashes. Pedestrian safety is improved with a large median refuge. The conflict between pedestrians and left-turning vehicles on Crosstown Parkway is eliminated because, as you saw, there people are crossing Crosstown Parkway when no one is going through Crosstown. The conflict points for pedestrians are reduced by 67% from 24 to 8. This also keeps Floresta Drive as a neighborhood street, and emergency vehicles can traverse the mountable curb in the median. 
This diagram shows the difference in the conflict points. The upper picture is a traditional intersection that has 32 conflict points. And that includes, I believe I counted 14 crossing conflict points in the center. That's where your T-bones and your head-on collisions happen is where people are crossing. In the below, in the lower diagram, there are only 14 conflict points in the entire intersection. Only two of them are the crossing severe conflict points. And then this slide shows the traffic benefits of the super street. And this is analyzed for the projected traffic for Crosstown Parkway at Floresta Drive. And you can see that the opening year level of service, which this was analyzed for 2017, obviously that's going to be more like 2019, um, that had a level of service of E for a traditional intersection with the super street based on the projected traffic, it improves to a level of service B. That's three levels of improvement. And then also for the design year, the design year for the traditional intersection was analyzed to be a level of service F, which is failing. With the super street, it improves to level of service C. Again, three levels of traffic improvement. Um, this is designed to last. The conflict points, as I said, are reduced from 32 to 14. And the average delay time was reduced from the traditional intersection of 122.6 seconds, over two minutes, to 14.7 seconds. It's eight times faster. And while this is new to Port St. Lucie, it's not a brand new type of intersection. These are some successful super streets in other states. They, this has been studied um, and it's found to be successful, more safe and better traffic as shown in several places in North Carolina, Ohio, Texas, Michigan, Louisiana, Maryland, Utah, and South Carolina. So this isn't the first one that's been designed, just the first one for Port St. Lucie and Florida, yes. Okay. Did I miss one? Oh. All right, I'm now Chris Brown, the project manager for Archer Western. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, my name is Chris Brown and I work for Archer Western Contractors. I'm the project manager for this project. Uh, we're the prime contractor. Our major subs are Ranger Construction, They'll be building the roadway, the earthwork, and the flat work. Uh, we have Felix. This will be doing installing the water and the sewer and the drainage. We'll also have traffic management solutions. They'll be installing the traffic lights, street lights, and signs. Uh, let me tell you more about Archer Western. We're part of uh, the Walsh Group in Chicago. Uh, we are established in 1983. We're an open shop contractor that op operates mainly in the southern regions of the United States. Uh, other projects uh, with Arch Western, uh, the toll plaza, toll plaza on the turnpike from Yeehaw Junction to Lake Worth, which included Fort Pierce, Fort St. Lucie, and Stewart. Also, the Boynton Beach Drawbridge. Ocean Avenue in Boynton Beach, and the Jensen Beach Causeway. Also, the Indian Street Bridge, which is known as the Veterans Memorial Bridge. This project is very similar to the Crosstown project. We also have many of the same key players on it. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to my uh, team. Josh McDermott is the project manager. Raise your hand if you're here. Guess he's not here, so all complaints go to him. All compliments come to me. Uh, Cloyce Poling, he is our project superintendent. Wayne Bennett, assistant superintendent. I got um, Chris Taylor, server manager. He's not here. Matt Richards, project engineer. Colton Griffin, office engineer. Lucas Jones, field engineer, and Bailey Cummings, intern. Our contract includes hiring local community members for on-the-job training program to this work. Let me move to the next, whoop, wrong way. Oh, that's already one. 
Uh, let's go back. On the job training program, we're going to train them as carpenters, operators, plow drivers, and welders. We'll be conducting a job fair for these positions in the near future. We want to thank the city of Port St. Lucie for this opportunity to build this landmark in this community. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Beth Soka. I'm the public information officer for the project. This is an exciting project for the city and we're so glad you're here tonight. We want you to stay involved and informed. Please visit our Crosstown website, crosstownextension.com. We're going to be putting updates throughout the project. You can see project photos. You can send us your email. We'll send you news updates and special events that are happening. Um, the Crosstown Hotline, I'm the one that answers it. So we want to hear from you. And this is your project, so we want you to be involved. Um, so a few things we have coming up that we'd love to invite you to. We have the groundbreaking event. That's tentative for May 9th. Um, that'll be on the project. We also have a job fair if you're interested in working on this job. Um, you'll have an opportunity to come and apply. Uh, so we hope to see you at some of the events. And again, um, that information will be on the uh, project website. So will all of the information from tonight's meeting um, by the end of this week. Um, I want to remind everyone that if we're about to open for question and answers, I do want to ask the mayor to come up and close. But um, I do want to remind you that um, if you'd like to speak, please pick a speaker card. Um, and we will call you in the order that the cards come. And um, you will be timed a three-minute limit because we have a large group here tonight. But I'm sure your neighbors have the same questions. So go ahead and um, be, be free to ask us. We have a lot of people here to help answer your questions. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Beth. PSI is pretty exuberant at the beginning. It's a long time coming. This is a pretty big room, a lot of energy in it. But I like to be very deliberate in expressing our thanks and delivering our thanks. Thank you to the citizens for funding this project and keeping the faith. Uh, thank you to all of our partners, our legislative champions at all levels. So this city council gets to be here for when the, when the construction happens, but City Council has been working on this for 37 years, so thank you to them. Thank you to our champions at the, at the TPO, the state, and the federal levels. Thank you to all of the partnering agencies like the Florida Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration, South Florida Water Management District, Department of Environmental Protection, the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Coast Guard. There's a whole alphabet soup, but they all help make the soup better, and we appreciate them. Uh, just recently, Congressman Mass has been very helpful in getting this to the finish line, so thank you. Thank you to the staff and our, and our professional team who kept fighting and finding a way to move this project forward. The blood, sweat, and tears and millions of dollars have gotten us here to this point where we can finally build it. And now let's be sure to get it done on time, on budget, and while being a good neighbor. And then let's do our best to get it done under budget ahead of schedule and Godspeed Archer Western and Team Port St. Lucie, citizens of Port St. Lucie. Thank you. Okay, excuse me. I will now open for question and answers. I'm going to call you in the order that I got the card. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, Charles Madden, are you still here and would you like to speak? Charles Madden? Okay, um, Ron Albert. Okay, Mr. Albert. Uh, the mic. We need the mic on, please. Oh. Okay. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you. Um, my questions are probably going to be directed at you, Rachel, because it has to do with the Floresta intersection. Um, first of all, I want to memorialize saying it's almost eight years ago today that I was at the ribbon cutting for the original Crosstown Parkway over by 95. Um, at that time, we were told that the uh, 
extension and the bridge would be completed somewhere around 2014 or 15. So we're a little disappointed that it has taken as long as it has. But uh, be that as it may, it's none of your fault. And uh, I just want to ask this question. In the years that I live right near Crosstown, over by 95, and the years that I've been entering it from my neighborhood and driving on it, um, the only major accidents I've ever seen have been coming out of a, an intersection like what you envision Floresta being. Uh, not at a, a, tr a traffic lit um, intersection, but specifically out of Congo Street, which is right near where I live. There was a very bad accident there, a young man coming out of the intersection on a motorcycle. That's the only one that I've ever seen or heard about. My, I'm curious, um, the, I see all the projects that you've used these super streets in, in, in various parts of the country, um, but I, I'm curious to know what kind of research you've done working with Florida drivers and specifically drivers in Port St. Lucie. That's part one. And part two is you, you've talked about the uh, signal, um, uh, signals being controlled automatically. Um, I drive on that road every day, and the, uh, the number of times I'm waiting at an intersection at a red light, and there are no cars going across in the other direction, are momentous. I mean, there's so many. It makes one wonder if, if, the, <laughs> if, if the traffic cameras that control those intersections are actually working properly. Okay. Okay. Um, well, all right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the first question I'm trying to remember it was: Have we designed these for Florida drivers? And the the short answer is going to be no, because this is the first one in Florida. But we do keep in mind the the Florida drivers, the elderly population. And I, it I is, take offense at that. Oh. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> you asked me about Florida drivers. I'm, I, I, I'll, I'm only teasing you. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have 16 years of experience designing in Florida. So all of my experience actually is for Florida drivers. We, it will be clearly signalized, striped, and marked. Um, I am, it, it is unfortunate to hear about the crash that you witnessed, but this is going to be all signalized. So there won't be... In fact, I believe we have a no turn on red on Floresta, so so there will not be, um, and, you know, you can't, unfortunately, you can't control what people do illegally, but um, if people are following the signs and following the signals, it will be very safe. If, if I could just interject, sure. one of the things that I notice, and on all three lane divided roads or six lane divided roads, three lanes in each direction, is that people entering those roadways, if they want to go in uh, and make a left turn at the next intersection, uh -huh. such as the U-turn that you're talking about, right. they will actually wait for all three lanes of traffic to go uh, before they enter the roadway, rather than we, when we were taught in driver education, you move into the rightmost lane and then you move over as you're able to. But from l reading this piece of paper, I see that that is signalized now, so that's going to eliminate a lot of that. That's, that's right, and actually the signs on Floresta will tell you which lane to get into. Okay. So if you are wanting to turn left, say that you're going north on Floresta and you want to go to 95, there are sign, will be signs on Floresta that tell you to get into the left lane right. so that you know exactly where to go. Now, if people don't follow the signs, I can't do anything about that, but True. there will be signs. True. Okay. Thank you for your answers. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to ask Gertrude Monaghan to come up. Okay, um, next we have Iris Romeo. My name is Iris Romeo. I started coming to Port St. Lucie in 1980. My aunt rented the house that I now own. Uh, it is on Calmoso Drive where three of the canals meet. It was a model home named the Iris. So I guess I should have belonged there. It was the 268th house built in Port St. Lucie. And the two questions that I had, one was about the intersection on Floresta, so that was answered. I was just wondering what the facilities for kayaking and that under the bridge will be. And then someone asked me to say, would there be any restrooms under there? 
I'll take that. Uh, we plan on putting an ADA compliant canoe kayak launch underneath the bridge in the coral reef trailhead area. If you'd like to see what one looks like, you can go to the newest one that was built as a result of the mitigation projects, and that is just off of US-1. I've been there, and it's beautiful. Yes, and by the way, uh, the website has a video that we created to show the uh, various mitigation sites and how to operate it. We had a handicapped uh, gentleman use it and was able to launch without getting his hands wet. So it, it's quite a facility. Secondly, as far as restrooms, on this project we are not planning to install restrooms, so go before you come. Okay, uh, Pat Simmons. Okay, and uh, she's coming. Um, following her, it'll be Carol Ann Williams. Good evening. Just two quick questions. First of all, I brought this up so I remembered to ask. These, um, the fish, it's the way I called it. Um, I want to make sure that those are going to be um, designed so that they're able to withstand hurricanes and they aren't going to go flying all around the city if um, the winds can pull them out. Even if they're flying fish, they won't actually fly. They will just be <laughs> in place. And my second question, now I understand where the new Wabat's going in this county. I get that. But between that intersection and other traffic that that's going to bring to um, Floresta and um, the boulevard right there. Um, and then with the um, the intersection also with the bridge. I'm just afraid that's going to be a disaster to be a prima vista. And I think at first it's going to take a lot of education because the WAP is going to bring in so much traffic we're hoping. And then with the bridge traffic as well and the new designed, I think that we will need a lot of education before that actually gets launched. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. I got it. Okay, uh, the first part of the question was how robust was our sculpture? That sculpture will in fact be designed for hurricane force winds. The anchoring system will have to be reviewed and approved by the engineer of record here. Uh, this is a stainless steel sculpture, 10 foot high, very robust, and certainly will meet all the criteria that the traffic lighting and all the other facilities do, so no worries. Uh, as far as your concerns about Floresta, I have a couple content, uh, comments. One of the things that you need to recognize is that the traffic on Floresta will be significantly reduced after this project. We now have people getting to the end of West Virginia and going north and south to go to either Prima Vista Boulevard or uh, Port St. Lucie Boulevard to get to US-1 eventually. Well, those folks won't need to do that anymore. So Floresta is going to become more of a local road. As far as education goes, as it relates to the Super Street and that intersection, we will have a blitz in providing demonstrations, presentations, information on the website to make sure everybody understands and is comfortable with that intersection. We're not going to let you down. We'll keep everybody informed and uh, we're, we're going to develop an education program we could take on the road. Okay, uh, Carol Ann Williams. I believe she had to leave. So, um, Patrice English Young. Good evening. 
Um, I'm here for the bikeists and the pedestrians and the cars because I do drive, I do ride, and I do walk. And I have had the opportunity to walk five miles, no, 10 miles round trip from Manth to 95 and back. In do, and this was regular, and just regular walking to get healthy. Now, my concern is the bicycle lanes. Um, as I'm walking, it is very, it looks very narrow because when I'm walking, I see the bikes riding and the cars, even though it says 12 feet and they're getting five feet, six inches for the bicycle lane, if that lane could be a little wider so that the cars aren't passing so close to them. I've seen memorials on my walk. I think I saw two of, you know, things happening to bicyclists. I think there's a white, I don't know, I'm thinking it's here, a white bicycle, that's a memorial. I'm, I hope I'm not mixing up the locations. So my request is, is there something that can be done so that those bike lanes are wider, especially on the bridge, as well as what happens too is that people then start riding on the path where the people are walking and um, you do not hear the bikes coming. And you can understand they're on the, for their safety. However, then the pedestrians and the dog walkers are at risk because the bikes are coming up quietly behind you and you don't see them. I myself have almost been hit by a bike, bicyclist coming by. But then I, what am I gonna say, go right into traffic with the cars that are passing so close. So my thing is what can be done so that everyone can be safe. And as I said, I'm a driver as well. Okay. I could take that. Well, the reality is those bike lane widths are, are basically a federal standard. That standard has actually increased in the last five years or so, I believe. And, and once again, that's something that the bicycle lobby can do. Once again, there would be a significant cost if we were to jump and create an extra two foot uh, a bike lane for every project, but once again, that's the kind of input that uh, the Federal Highway Administration and some of the bigger agencies will deal with in changing the standards. The second thing is on the bridge, although we have a designated bike path, the entire shoulder is available for you. So you don't just have the bike lane, you have the bike lane and the remainder of the shoulder, which gives you much more forgiveness. So. Bicycling over the bridge, frankly, will give you that extra margin of safety that you're looking for and separating the pedestrians from the bicycles. Hope that answers your questions. But don't give up on your quest if, in fact, you think it's important. Thank you. Uh, Marie Dorlene. Hi, my name is Marie Dorlene. My question is regarding U-turns and left turns on US-1 going south and Village Green going north. I don't know if anybody realized that, but left signal that allows you to make a left turn and coming from Village Green, the signal that allows you to make a right turn comes both at the same time. And if you're having those things, could you make sure that both lights don't come at the same time to avoid accidents? You understand what I'm, my question? I, I do. You're saying that there are people who are turning a U-turn from US-1 and the right turn on Village Green at the same time? There is a signal. There are, there are left uh -huh. arrows from US-1 going south to make that left turn uh -huh. or either a left turn or U-turn. Okay. Okay. At the same time, on Village Green, there is a right owl, and they come at the same time. And the reason I know, I used to work right there at Liberty Lane, uh -huh. and I'm a pedestrian. And I always was, when I'm crossing, why is the Village Green car turning right on me? Until I stop there and look, both have the right to turn. Right. And no, forget I the pedestrian.
Right. Right. I, I, unfor unfortunately, I, I don't have the signal timing in front of me. I know that we are improving the intersection with additional turn lanes, but we do have to follow the standards. And I, I, I don't know it off offhand. Um, it's something that we could could check, but it, it's going to be whatever the standards are. I'm, I'm sorry. But my question is, why are both turns at the same time? I'd have to check the, the plans and see Thank what the you. signal timing shows. Please do. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark Bryant. Evening. How are you? <laughs> Almost 40 years. Wow. That's sad to say before I was born. <laughs> this project is finally here. <laughs> Anyhow, I have some concerns, like uh, the Super Street and north of the Super Street where Manth is. Would there be a turning signal there? At Manth, there isn't a, isn't a turn signal. Those actually are going to be right in, right out, so you will only be able to turn right at Manth Lane. Okay, and another question on US-1. Um, it's cool that you're bringing a sing, uh Super Street, the first in the state of Florida, but wouldn't also uh, Super Street be uh, visible at US-1 and Village Green simply because there'd be more traffic there and it's not as much residential, it'd be more open air and stuff like that. I mean, it's great at Floresta too because of the residential, but also at Village Green where it'd be easier, you have three lanes right there and also turning on to Village Green, which is already a two lane highway Right. No, actually, it's interesting that you asked that because we, we did look at some alternative intersection types at US-1. And unfortunately, unlike at, at Crosstown and Floresta, there's a lot of right-of-way that the city acquired. And it, it, there just isn't the right-of-way at US-1. We actually did look into that when we were doing the proposal because there is so much traffic at US-1 and Village Green. And we, we thought that something without the you know, triple lefts is a lot. There aren't very many triple left turn lanes if you, if you look around. Um, but Unfortunately, there just wasn't the right of way to do something there. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All I got to say is, great job. And as Mayor Orbeck gave the nickname to City Manager of Blackburn, get her done. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Dezerka. Apologize for the names. People mess up my last name all the time, too. Um, Henry Schmidt. Good evening. Uh, we have four years in Port St. Lucie. I enjoy the city very much. And I'm also locked in because we're in South Bend area. So I get to experience uh, all the uh, Port St. Lucie Boulevard traffic. Picked up all the habits. I know how to take the corner from Route 1 onto Port St. Lucie Boulevard at 40 miles an hour with everybody else. <laughs> Don't enjoy the 5 o'clock traffic on Port St. Lucie Boulevard at all, particularly trying to get to a South Bend. Um, I think you guys uh, picked a tremendous project. I think the city will be very proud of that. I have a uh, uh, shop at uh, St. Lucie West, so I normally do the 95 and cross down. Uh, as there was a comment made earlier, however, that I would bring up to your attention is that, you know, as you go on Kashmir, California and all that, sometimes I can't buy a green light. Is there going to be some sort of a signalization coordination or timing that, that you guys planning for? Patricia, why don't you hop in there and tell them, and tell them about the, uh, the support evening. system. Good evening, everyone. I didn't get a chance to thank you all for being here. And uh, Mayor and Council, thanks so much. Um, that actually is a signal timing system that we continue to work on mm -hmm. and will continue to work on. One of the issues that arises is that there is a lot of traffic on the side streets. 
especially at an intersection, for instance, like Bayshore. Mm -hmm. So when we get the complaints about the main line, we're getting the complaints. If we fix the main line, we get the complaints from the side streets. So it's a balancing act, okay. but we will continue to work on the technology that allows us to do better. And we are buying and purchasing that technology. So we will continue, sir. That's a public works issue. It's not for the design team today. Okay. Thanks for your input. Very good. Thank you, and keep up the good work. Mr. Schmidt, thank you, and thank you for, for that issue because we do get a lot. And uh, Patricia, I don't think you sold it all of the way. She, she's working tirelessly with the whole department, and it's going to be interconnected, and it is going to talk to each other, and it is going to adjust in real time to maximize the flow. Now, we can't guarantee, Mr. Schmidt, that you will be in the, on the right side of that intersection to get through but I, we can assure you that we are working towards that system where all the signals in Port St. Lucie, all of them under our management, talk to each other in real time based on real counts and maximize the efficiency of those intersections. That's, that's on its way, and that's something that the Public Works Department is working hard on. I also picked up another habit, for instance, and I know if I have to get to Fort Pierce, if I, about 47 miles an hour on Route 1, you make them all, by the way. <laughs> You got to get the garage door opener like I have. I just click it and I, I go right direct. Uh, thank you, Julianne Gagliardo. It's a long day. I should have. Where to begin? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having this meeting. It was really appreciated to have a structured meeting with an agenda. Um, it, it was just a really nice thing. And Mr. Denty, it was really nice to see somebody have such excitement and passion for their job. Kind of reminded me when I get a new reading program for my students. And that's you know, good for you. And I, I love that passion. I do, however, have a couple of concerns. Of course, the super straight, but we'll get into that later. My main concern, and hopefully you can help, is with I might not, I know by myself. With the Crosstown Parkway cut off at Sandia to Floresta, I live right on Evergreen. The amount of traffic from the detours, of course it's going to be more. I understand that. I get it. However, the speeding is out of hand. Now, I did reach out to Stephanie Morgan. She got right back with me. She's been fantastic. I think I even got a voice message from you. Um, I'm not going to say your name right. Ms. Oska? Okay, good. Um, so, I mean, the communication has been great. Um, and soon after our, my conversation, the Port St. Lucie Police Department put out a little, the speed limit is 25, you're going, and then the lights flash. And then, you know, after a couple of days, people saw that as a challenge. And they kept going faster and faster and faster. Um, I leave for work at 645 in the morning. And as I'm driving west on Evergreen, people are coming off of Floresta, tailgating me. I actually got passed, passed twice in the last two weeks. My concern is the safety of the children walking to their bus stops, the safety of the people going to the Crosstown Connector bus stops, because those have been all been moved from West Virginia to Evergreen, and it's a safety issue for me. And I would I say this carefully, I would really love to have a police presence Maybe they can just hang out in my yard. It's fine. And watch me get the first ticket. But that would be just me. <laughs> and so that's my main concern. That's my very first and main concern is the safety of my neighbors. Because that is my neighborhood. I've grown up right there at Ground Zero for the last 34 years. <sighs> Which brings me to the Super Street. Um, I have serious concerns. I drive on Floresta. I go to the Floresta Center. I live north of the Crosstown Parkway. If I need a gallon of milk, now I'm going to have to go through a maze both ways to get come and go. Um, it's just, it's frustrating. We're the people who live at Ground Zero. We live in the heart of Port St. Lucie. We're the first neighborhoods in Port St. Lucie. A lot of us, a lot of my neighbors here have lived here for a long, long, long time. And we're, we're, we're having to, to deal with a lot of impact from the drivers, for the traffic, for everything going on. Um, I don't, I'm taking too long. Um, <laughs> and it just seems like it's just constant. We're the ones that are sacrificing, sacrificing, sacrificing. 
um, the Super Street just was kind of just rubber stamped and pushed through in my opinion. Now I may be wrong on that and I think that's my timer, but, and I know it's rubber stamped through, it's going to be going through, but when you close Floresta to make the Super Street and our roads are going to be really inundated, I really hope that you can help keep us safe. Thank you. Um, we have been working with the police department and um, talked to them about presence in the area. So I know that they uh, know that concern and they have uh, been working towards that. So thank you for your comment. Um, Paul Cowknapp? Oh, I'm sorry, there's more. There we go. Um, to, to address the concerns about the Super Street, I, I do understand about the concerns about Floresta and I know it's hard to imagine now um, looking at it, but the increase of traffic on Crosstown Parkway based on the traffic analysis would be, have been so great that people, drivers on Floresta would not have even been able to get through the intersection if it were a traditional intersection. I know it's hard to believe, but the numbers simply do not lie. Um, it is going to be better for traffic for both Crosstown Parkway and Floresta Drive, and you'll just have to see it to believe it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Paul Cowknapp? Who's playing, space, who's playing Space Invaders over there? <laughs> yeah, good evening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, uh, put the super, super street to death. I find, I find that as a not Port St. Lucie intersection. My thinking, and I don't know why, treat Crosstown like an expressway with an intersection. What you do is you take Floresta, you put a bridge over top of the Crosstown. Crosstown has no lighting, it runs fl fl uh, freely through. You have your ramps come up to the top of the bridge, you have a traffic light, you wanna, be, you wanna go north on Floresta, you wanna go south on Floresta. <laughs> You could do the same. Now you could do the curve, you know, the merge, but maybe you don't have the uh, the, the the land access for that. But you and then, what do you do if you have an emergency vehicle? You've got an ambulance going up to this intersection. You've got a fire truck coming up this intersection. Across the street, they see this house burning. By the time this guy in the fire truck goes around here and around there and around there. The house is burnt down. A guy on the other side is having a heart attack. This this emergency vehicle around to there. Hang on, they, they don't have to do that. It's a mountable curb in the median. The emergency vehicles do not have to go around the U-turns. So well, it's it, never been discussed. Yes, it was. I said it in the presentation. It I was on my that. slide. I yeah. didn't hear that. It, well, anyways, and but we've what also I'm saying met is, with the emergency responders and we discussed the intersection and let them know and um, yeah. that that was an option for them. Yeah. As well. But I just, I just see if you had a ramp that goes over top Floresta and then your, your, your uh, cross down doesn't have any intersection and it flows perfectly through. The thing that we have in here in Florida and in Port St. Lucie is tourists and visitors. Do you know how many people who are not exposed to a circle, they have no clue how to get to the other side? What are they going to do with a super street? When we, we we're going to deal that we live here. We're going to deal if we're driving on it. But if you're a, if you're if you're a, a stranger to town, you want to where the hell do I get over there? That's going to be the fact. A couple other things: the the bridge that you're going to have the four um, uh, cubicles or display things on the corner. They're they're very nice. Now the question is. You said that you're going to have a mural, a, a, a ceramic mural, and then the, 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 are they going to be lit for nighttime? Okay, it wasn't discussed, but anyways, I think that's a, a very yeah, nice the answer feature. Is yes. Yeah, that, that's good. Like all four sides or, or just the bridge side 
because I don't know whether you need them on the river side because you got people back there. But, but I think that's a very good thing if we're going to spend that. If you want to accent them at night and stuff like that. And one last little thing is about lighting. And, and somebody mentioned they did the Indian Street Bridge, and that's an excellent bridge, and that's, a, and, and that's an excellent road over there. It is. Are we going to have nice uh, uh, street lighting like they did down there, or are we going to have the same old little pole up here with water? They have very decorative lighting. And, and the thing I find problem with the existing Crosstown is the fact is that the only lighting is on the two sidewalks way out here. You've got a medium. Why don't we have... Sir, your time. You Can you please wrap it up? Thank you. Okay. We're going to have lighting, and let's light this up. You have a, a broken down car at night. You're out there in the dark. You have, you have a, a, a bike path, and, and it's in the dark. Not very safety proportion. Well, a couple of answers for you. Uh, the, the lighting across the bridge will will be highway lighting, much like the Indian Street Bridge. <laughs> now, it won't be as decorative, because here's something we learned, and as we continue with these projects, we don't make the same mistakes. The prettier the lighting, the less robust it is during a storm. We lost a significant number of lights on the Jensen Causeway the, and the Lions Causeway as a result of putting in some of that aesthetic lighting. We're putting the more robust lighting in there. Of course, it's going to be the Verde Green cover color, and it'll be attractive, but perhaps not as ornate. The, the lighting you see on the parkway is pedestrian lighting, and it is not designed to be highway lighting. It is for the safety of pedestrians. So don't confuse it. Uh, the parkway really doesn't have highway lighting to speak of. Uh, and it would be an initiative to add that to the entire corridor, of course. Uh, what, what else did he add? Oh, yes, the mural and the uh, statue will have up lighting. Uh, it'll be pretty dramatic at night. I think that uh, it will become one of those postcards for Port St. Lucie. Uh, thank you, Trina Mardina. Mirandino? I'm so very sorry if I messed that up. Is she here? Um, Thomas Kerr? By the way, we got one more tip on uh, Super Street. The gentleman had mentioned about people unfamiliar and out of town, and we've come up with an idea. You know, today everybody uses their phone or MapQuest or their TomToms to navigate. We're going to reach out and proactively meet with these companies and get the Super Street modified, shown on those maps so that when you're following that, and I call it a navigator, the person who guides you through uh, your uh, roadways, it will recognize the Super Street and tell you what to do. So thinking ahead, perhaps we can uh, minimize the confusion there. And that's our goal to try to minimize that confusion and make everybody a believer. Robert Waddle, Waddell, sorry. I'm very sorry. Kimberly Bales is uh, following him, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to talk tonight. Most of the people have already answered my questions before I came up here. And I've been told this is a waste of time because nothing's gonna change and that all of our concerns, are, it's, we're pretty much done. But I insisted on my wife that I at least wanted to say something. You did a great job. And the gentleman saying about emergency vehicles responding also did a great job. I'm sad that he left. I've been driving fire engines almost 25 years. I know you say that the curb is not going to affect us. It will. Speed bumps affect us. Fire engines, ladder trucks, rescue trucks are affected by any curb. The suspension is horrible. And if you're in the back of a rescue truck, you hit it, it's going to, it's going to hurt the patient. And it does slow us down. I know you spoke with um, our fire chiefs, and um, I trust them. But it will slow us down. <clears throat> the super street's been beaten to the ground tonight. I'm sure everybody here is tired of hearing it. It's actually called an R-cut. 
And if you look it up, the last study that I can find was in 1996. So my question is, or statement, since I don't think we can change anything at this point. The R cut is more for low to medium traffic volume, not for high volume. Floresta Drive does not have sidewalks on it all the way through. We don't have commercial. We have one school and a Cumberland Farms and a pharmacy. I drive up and down for the last 20 years on Floresta with people in the road, kids in the road, because there are no sidewalks from Floresta to Prima, to Prima Vista. There's a sidewalk that goes... <laughs> for maybe a few blocks and then stops. Thornhill has sidewalks all the way down, no schools, no commercial, no pedestrians. These are the issues that I see when I drive down there. How has somebody not been killed Walk going down Floresta on a bicycle? How, much, how many times has Floresta, you've had to stop to go around somebody on a bicycle or a child walking on the street to get to Cumberland Farms? The surrounding roads in this area have not been touched, updated, or repaired in 20 years other than somebody coming out with a bag of asphalt and pounding it down. In the meantime, we spent millions of dollars on failed projects, improving roads like Thornhill to a high volume. There's nothing on there. Floresta goes one way to the other. Nothing. So again, not a question. I'm making some statements. I didn't have the time to prepare. I did it sitting out there. So, you know, there, everything else has pretty much been addressed. I, I guess I want to know if it's low income, I mean low traffic or high. If it's high volume, are we going to be able to change this R cut in the road? If not, are we wasting our time even talking about it tonight? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I, I can answer the question if you want to wait just no, a minute. I just want to sit down. It's nervous enough for me to come okay. up here in front of you guys. Well, the, the one thing I did want to point out is that the, yes, it is abbreviated as RCUT Restricted Crossing U-Turn, as I said. And the reason that we implemented, that we proposed it and it was approved through the ATC process is because of the difference between the high volume Crosstown Parkway and the low volume Floresta. That actually is a big reason why the Super Street works from the traffic analysis because otherwise, if you, if you use a traditional intersection, then the people from Floresta simply d never get a chance to turn left because there's so much traffic on well, you, Crosstown. You brought up a good point. When you, when you talked about sinking the lights. Now, I know we have fiber optics in our lights now. We've had this technology for a while. And I've called a few times because I used to live in PGA and had to come to Floresta. My mother lives here. My daughter has a house here. We have a community just in my family alone. I asked, why aren't these lights synced? And they've never been synced. And, and I've been told that we're working on it. We're making our own program. Why in reinvent the wheel at Jupiter and other counties in Florida? It's already done by the program. In Jupiter, as I'm going in a fire engine, all the lights turn green ahead of me. They have fiber optics. We have fiber optics. It didn't take them this many years to do that. When I go in the fire engine, I look down, all the lights turn green as I go. If we can, I know it's been beaten to the ground. Again, why reinvent the wheel? And Mayor, I've, I've been watching their channel, this public access channel, and I'd love to see you guys speak and address some of these things. But could we take an example from some of these other cities, use what they've already learned, save the money that we're wasting time on trying to reinvent the wheel, and just do it? Thank you. I get, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself. My wife's probably already upset with me, so I'm going to go sit down. Thank you. Were all the technical questions addressed? Because then I'd like to go ahead and hit the, uh, the policy and then the politics of that. So all the technical issues were addressed. So I'm uh, direct to a fault. Uh, could ask Mrs. Orvik and probably any number of people in this room. So when George and Randy were in the city manager conference room and I visited the city manager's office to learn about the super street, if I would have had laser vision at that particular moment, 
the best George could have hoped for was to have hair like mine. That would have been the absolute best that he got out of there with. But the reality is in our system, things are, are done by consensus process. And this issue was brought to the council probably a year ago at a time when perhaps it could have been addressed. But I got to say that right now the team has committed to this and we're kind of at a full throttle point. This isn't the point to modify permits to stop the project. And so just to be, to hit that nail sh just flush, my sense is even though I might personally in my individual capacity sympathize with that position, I think the reality is is that much like Mrs. Gallardo made a presentation and talked about make sure that we stay safe, we have to make sure we stay safe and this functions as the engineers promised. If not, there'll have to be a reconciliation that, that occurs. So that's, I think, where we're at, to be quite, quite honest, because here on the cusp of getting this thing done, in anticipation of this meeting, staff's already circulated some memorandum, memoranda about how long it would take if we change now, how much money it would take, and I think, I think we're committed. And so I say that as even being personally sympathetic, but given that I brought it up a year ago, I, I can't pursuant to the rules, bring it up again. You know, sometimes you move forward as a group and I defend the team on it because we're finally to the point where we're moving forward and moving forward is more important than making sure that every knit is satisfied to everyone's complete satisfaction because let's, in a room full of this many people, how many things are we gonna get 100% buy-in on? It's, it's, it's hard, but we, we, try to, we try to get the, the most. So. All, while some of us want to see that super street pulled, it's in, and I think we're united. There, there's a couple people here that were challenging the bridge, but this room was united in getting cross down done. So that's number one. So let's address that. Two, as far as the synchronization, that's happening, and I'm sorry that sometimes things take longer than we think they should. Uh, but we, the the staff really is working on that synchronization and getting. The, the system talking to each other. And it's because we have a thousand lane miles of road. We're 125 square miles. We have belly crawled out of the depression and we're finally to the point where we're coming back. And it's an exciting time and I'm sorry it's not done yet, but I think the council and the staff are united in making sure that those signals talk to each other in real time and manage it for maximum efficiency. It doesn't mean you won't get stopped. It just it means that those intersections will push through as many people as possible. And then let's get to Floresta. Because once upon a time before we hit the depression, there was a choice made that Becker would be done before Floresta. And that, that, was, that was a choice because you have limited money and you have to pick priorities. Now whether or not we agree with it, it happened. And so now I think everything happens for a reason. If we would have done Floresta back in the day, it would have been blown out as a four lane divided arterial, much like Bayshore or Rosso. And it's actually my hope after meeting with many of you in the community, that Floresta doesn't have to be a four lane divided road, that the intersections at PSL Boulevard and others need to be improved, no question. But that the road itself could be a tree line, sidewalk line, bike line road that you're proud to live on. That's the hope, and that won't truly reveal itself until we get Crosstown done. So it's, was it yesterday like we wanted? No. Will it be two years from now? No, because they said it'll take 800 days for Crosstown. Now we're trying to shave that down to 700, 730. No, we, 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 could, yeah, we, we could talk more about this, and you can come to a, a council meeting, but I, I, think that I've, I think I've addressed each of your issues. Sir, we got to continue with the, the question and answer, but I'm happy to have this conversation with you. Yeah, hit, hit that new issue, please. Yeah, we will be maintaining boat traffic. We're going to accommodate the North Fork of the St. Lucie River. We will leave a span out of the center until the very last thing. We'll, we'll put that in by barge. We'll probably need a week shutdown for that. As far as Coral Reef goes, we're working on the accommodations. It'll be either a lift, a removable span. Uh, we're going to survey the boaters that use Coral Reef, look at their vertical clearance needs, and accommodate them somehow, whether it be by a drawbridge, 
a removal section, or a free year in the marina. We're going to work out something that you're happy with. <laughs> well, we're going to survey the, the uh, boats using that waterway and accommodate their needs. Yes, sir. Can you speak oh, in the microphone so everybody the, can hear your questions? Sorry. I the, think permanent, I the permanent, the permanent, I'm already past my time, but some of the boats on Coral Reef and in the North Fork of the River are large boats. And that's part of the selling point in the property values. And the mayor adjust, uh, addressed how our area is considered low income based on a medium value. And one of the- I, the I did not say low income. Uh, it's the income of this area is considered not as high as St. Lucie West. Even the sign coming on the rest of this says, welcome to poor St. Lucie. It's not much better than the yard sale sign. And many times it's overgrown so you can't even see it. But when I go to St. Lucie West, the signs in the streets are beautiful. When I lived in Traditions, the roads were paved. I was only there for three years and it was paved twice. You can literally pick up the asphalt in front of my house on, in the Floresta area. I probably should sit down because <laughs> I could go on and on. Thank you. Well, the reality is that the North Fork of the St. Lucie River, the bridge vertical clearance will be greater than that at Port St. Lucie Boulevard and Long Creek Bridges. So we're accommodating the boat traffic there. Thank you. And uh, uh, the okay. you do that, yeah, I'll take you out in the boat names. with us. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and call the next Yeah, I don't name. want to take anybody else's time. I'm really sorry Thank that you. I went over my time. Thank you. Kimberly Bales. I am basically just piggybacking off of the um, sidewalks. I live off of Atlantis. We're right smack in the middle of Crosstown Parkway and Kiwanis Park. And we have a lot of kids down our street and the streets surrounding. Um, I was hoping as the years watching, you know, all the plans come by that when Crosstown Parkway would be done, they'd think of all the families who would be walking down the nice sidewalks and Crosstown Parkway and might want to hang a right or hang a left and go to the park and let their kids play, but there's no sidewalk. Um, I mean, I live right on the end and I still don't even walk in the grass to get to the park. I walk all the way down my street and then around. Um, is there any plans for the future? You, co you covered it a little bit. Is there any plans for the future based on you know surveys or when you see the amount of pedestrian traffic going that way that they're going to put a sidewalk in any time in the near future that you know of? The difficulty, and Patricia, I don't know if you want to jump in with the uh, sidewalk master plan, but this year we will be updating our sidewalk master plan. We've been very incremental to date. Originally okay. we started with, and when I say we, the, count, the former council uh, from more than a decade ago said, you know what, we have such a big problem, we're just going to start with within two, mile, two miles of all schools. That's our right. sidewalk plan. And now we're finally to the point where we're seeing sidewalks throughout the city on places like Cameo and California. Mm -hmm. We're finally at a place now where instead of just being incremental and being in triage, we could look into the future about what we want the outcome to be. And this is where the, you know, this is this is where it gets hard because we're talking about crosstown that's going to be done in two and a half years, two if we're lucky, especially if Cuban coffee's flowing. <laughs> uh, so that's how long it's going to take for that road. That's when the traffic pattern reveal itself. So already we're 2019. And now the design and funding of Floresta with whatever improvements that we want to do is, is right. going to cost a million plus probably, right. more than hundreds of thousands. So now we're talking 2021. And so this is why everything ties together. This is why uh, knocking down some of those failed economic investments, freeing up cash flow and putting it into infrastructure projects. Honestly, probably PSL Boulevard South is the next road that gets done in Port St. Lucie. And then probably is where it depends on the council, and then it's Floresta. So the good news is it's it's a priority. The bad news, unless something fundamentally changes, unless the county decides to do that local option sales tax again that, that failed, we won't have the funding to make it happen. I gotta tell you, this is the biggest frustration as an elected official, folks, is someone like you who just wants sidewalks for your kids or wants a park. And the reality is is that we agree, we should provide it, but we can't provide it for four years and that your child is already in college. That is, I gotta tell you, that is about one of the worst things about this job 
but it's also the reality. So we have to work together to try to move it up because we did go through some of the neighborhood planning process on Floresta. And I really do think that there's a, a shared vision on that, that you're, bless you, that you're going to see Floresta improved. You're going to be proud of it. And it's going to be more like, uh, let, let's say, a, a well-paved Westmoreland or, or Morningside than, than a Bayshore slash Oroso. But we probably, honestly, if I said we could get to it sooner than four years without some kind of change in the funding, I, I don't want to lie to you. I don't ever want to lie to you. Okay, thank but you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean Ann Frias? But we absolutely, just, just to hit it, we absolutely will. This, this retreat, this winter and summer retreat, we're talking sidewalk master plan. And we definitely, you, you see the vice mayor back there, she's here. We, the whole council is here, I'm here. We'll, we'll make sure that that's addressed. Thank you. Also those gateway signage. Yeah, no, no room for litter or, or high grass anywhere in the city. I'm glad this is going, finally. I'm glad it's taken off. Um, everything sounds good with it. The bridge, the bridge area where you have the, the nice benches and that's it. Is everybody fishing off that? And if so, have you planned for extra parking? Ma'am, there are no fishing facilities planned for it. The reality it's off is... off the bridge. Uh, well... You, usually in a, in a community, they dictate whether there's a prohibition or not. Gotcha. Oftentimes I've found that in, uh, people can fish there until they abuse the facility. Okay. Then the municipality comes up with rules because people aren't cleaning up or they're in the way of pedestrians. So might I think that it might start out that you can fish there and if you have respect of others in the bridge, it might continue. But it's a, it's a local prerogative. Okay. Again, I'm glad it's happening. Um, I sympathize with the lady, you know, on Floresta wanting the sidewalks, and I'm hearing that project may be coming up after this project. Please don't forget about us in the Port St. Lucie Boulevard, Darwin to Becker area. We don't have sidewalks or anything else. I know this project here is going to be like gas sex and being eating fat man. It's going to open up a whole lot of stuff, and I know more businesses and traffic will move around a whole lot easier. And with the speeding, I also sympathize with the other lady that uh, on her road, you know, getting tailgating there. The people, they're all but. I live on a road, unfortunately, there's four other exits in my neighborhood that lead you to the boulevard, and everyone likes McCoy Avenue for some reason. And they'll come from all the way back, par, just to come out McCoy, and they haul butt, and the speed limit's 30 miles an hour, but. I mean, no one knows a limit anymore. That word just doesn't exist on these speed limit signs anymore. <laughs> Everybody does what they want to do. Um, but the law enforcement, I love that. I hope you get more law enforcement on the streets. I wish that you would get them all laser and radar certified and let them write from that one to five mile an hour over because that'll make a big difference. Right now they don't write. Not everyone is radar certified. But it would just make a big difference to put more power in the police hands as far as traffic control. These people are nuts out there. I hate driving. I want to pull my hair out. I don't text and drive, but I see text and drive, but I'm just waiting to get killed by a texter and driver. Thank That's you, ma'am. <laughs> thank you very much. Jim, uh, thank you. Jimmy Sheffield. Hey, Patricia, I don't, I don't know that the council settled the uh, policy issue of fishing, but if that's a policy issue that's out there, and uh, you could bring it to the council. I just want to state that I'm pro-fishing, and I would hope that we would have uh, places to recycle line and that fishing, fishing be allowed. And then as far as uh, police, we are the safest large city in Florida. The traffic enforcement unit has been, uh, has been reconstituted, and as we go through the budget process, we trust the chief to let us know what his requirements are through the city manager to make sure that we keep everyone safe on our roads. Thank you. Good evening. Just a couple of quick questions, starting with uh, the bridge. Once it's all finished and done, I'm sure the lighting will be aesthetically appealing and functional and so forth. But during the construction phase, uh, living back on Coral Reef, it is worse than dark. And you may or may not be aware, a couple months ago, there was actually a shooting right there near the construction site. So during the phase of the construction between now until it's 
transition and completion, we definitely need some sort of at least temporary lighting back there. That's going to be a, a nice thing to add. It's not, I think what it is is just the city can't tolerate an inactive area without being residential and homeowners protecting their own property. The construction site goes dormant, you know, all night long. We've seen four wheelers running through the thing and not, not a good thing to have in the middle of the night and uh, be awoken by gunshots is not a good thing. So um, as far as the, the fishing and the park setting and so forth, what will be the access? Will it be a dusk to dawn type policy or is it going to be loosely regulated or is there something in place? I know that may be more on a local level. Caught you off guard, Greg. I, no, I just I didn't know if you wanted to wait and fully <laughs> no, no, present, and then we'll answer all the questions. No, I, I just, don't want to interrupt that one there, and then time. I'm going to throw in another one to you, and I'll be all set. But yeah, just the fishing. I don't know if that's going to be a, just a. I know there's no restroom facilities on site, but it, is it going to be more of a dusk? Uh, expected to be an empty park setting. You think, it sounds or? like we actually need to come up with a policy, so we'll entrust Patricia and the city manager to bring it to the okay. council and decide. My my expectation or thinking is that uh, Parks and Rec will ultimately manage this property as a yeah. recreation area, okay. and all of these things can happen over time. You know, it might not start with the restroom facility, but if it's heavily utilized, it's not like that could never happen. Right. Uh, hours of operation, all of that could be specified. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to do something for the next two years while uh, George is making sure the, the, the bridge gets built. Sure. <laughs> uh, and as far as uh, speed limits, I know a lot of the information was online, but do you anticipate any changes in the speed limit around and leading up to the entrance or construction points of the bridge, say from Floresta, Coral Reef, and where it uh, coming from, say, west on Village Green and coming over? heading well from the east to west is there any speed limit changes anticipated i'd say village green would be one good one to look at when i turn on there to go every morning over to the office if i'm doing 30 i nearly i just have to pick which door i want ran into because i'll get run slap over <laughs> it's horrible 30 is probably the law but it's more of a recommendation to a lot of people utilizing that corridor right now for a drag strip i think just a food for thought um I guess that's mostly it. The lighting, uh, the temporary thing, until the construction is complete, I think we would definitely like to see some sort of, you know, maybe not generators running all night and whatever, but I don't know if there's a temporary pole or something could be utilized just for the, even solar. That would be fantastic, you know. And I think they already addressed the access in and out of the waterway during the construction will probably not come down to more than about a week of not being able to get in and out. That's pretty much it. The lighting especially. Thank you. I think we could probably talk to the contractor. He has some motivation to light that area from a security standpoint. I think we could probably come up with some lighting. Maybe, maybe the city has some in public works and we can install those temporarily. Okay. I don't know if, if the, as a designer, Rachel and your team, if they looked at the, the posted versus, versus the speed study possibilities for Village Green Drive for, for that particular drive. No, the posted versus, you know, doing a speed study for Village Grain Drive. Has there anything been done with the design? We, we have not. We were okay. dictated the, the design speeds that we had. To okay. Use. So that would be a city issue. Thank you. Uh, John Harley. My name is John Harley. I've been here two two and a half years, and I came from a Washington, D.C. transplant. But I was, I'd like to echo what the lady was talking about earlier. If you've been to D.C. and you get in that traffic, and that's something to complain about. I, I don't see any reason why anyone here needs to speed. I mean, I haven't gotten a ticket. I used to always get tickets. But, I, I mean, there's no hurry here. Uh, and 
so I mean, I don't understand why people cut you off and they want to jump in front of you and all this kind of mess. I think we need a. In other words, I echo what she's saying. We need. I'd like to see a little more police presence there. And uh, Mr. Brown was saying he takes compliments. To Mr. Brown said he was taking compliments today, so I'm going to give him one. Yeah. I've had the opportunity of talking with him several times. He's been his, he's demonstrated great social skills in the community right around where I live. So, you know, I'd like to say thank you, and he's very conscious of us. He said, I'm your neighbor now. So, and, you know, that's, I, I liked it. I liked it, you know, so thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. You deserve it. I, you know I don't give too much. I, you deserve it. <laughs> All right, I'd say good night to everybody. Thank you. Uh, Michael Elliston. Hi, my name is Mike Elliston. I'm the owner and operator of Kayaks and Stuff of the Treasure Coast, a kayak back, kayak based eco tour company. Um, I actually had quite a bit of notes planned out to, to bring up tonight, but most of them, as Mayor Orbeck has said, is in regards to the route, which is said and done with. There's no changing that. So the other concerns that I do have is in regards to the route and the construction time period. As Mayor Orbeck is aware, at the Listen to the, the Rivers sem seminars that, we, that he had attended last year, I was there as well. In the Evans Creek area of the, the St. Lucie River is a tarpon spawning area. Um, what is going to be done to, to, prevent, to protect the tarpon in that area during the spawning season if the bridge construction is expect, expected to take two years? That's two spawning periods that are going to be interrupted. Um, another con concern I have is that came up tonight is you said that structures, uh, monuments on each, at, the, at the bridge, on top of it's going to be stainless steel. That's highly reflective. Uh, the, in the morning and evening low light, low light level conditions, light, the light angle, is there anything that's going to be done to protect the, reflect, the reflectingness from blinding drivers? Yes, the, that's brushed stainless steel, by the way, okay. so it's glare proof. Okay, uh, and as far as the ADA launch, uh, that's going to be at Coral Reef. Um, I've seen the kayak launch on the other side of the river, on, on the east side. It's a great launch design. The only problem is it's too far to haul kayaks from your vehicle to the launch site. If, I, if, if you could go down to Stewart and take a look at the launch at Hosford Park, that launch distance is a lot better distance if you could try and reduce the length of kayaks have to transport to get to the water. So, so, and as George said, don't give up on your quest. I hope, to, I hope there's going to be something done to protect the environment in the, in, along that route. Well, thanks for your concerns. Uh, we have the same concerns. Uh, we are extremely involved in the environmental aspects of the project. We have a environmental scientist on our staff. We're providing an education to every worker on the project. We'll have individual several hours of training to identify the species. We just recently completed a bald eagle survey, found some animals. We know what to do with uh, the interaction between the animals, the Florida fauna, and our project. We can live together. We have bubble curtains designed that will accommodate the fishery so that the, the, we don't have any issues with construction versus the spawning habits. Uh, we're pretty familiar with all this stuff, and uh, we stayed our, we've stayed out of trouble in building the other bridges, both in Martin County, Jensen Beach. Uh, Stewart, etc. We've managed to build those without any in environmental violations. Our impacts are few, and I like to think that uh, we're building with the environment, not against it. Thank you, George Tuttle. Okay, um, Simone Boyce, Ronald. Mistretta. Good evening. I'm unfortunately the owner of the house, which is north, which is just north of the bridge, the 
first house, 1159 Coral Reef. <clears throat> My house has been damaged by the destruction of the house next to me. And uh, I'd like to know what recourse will everybody have if their homes are damaged? Where does the responsibility lie? Is the city going to take responsibility for it? The FDOT going to take responsibility for it? Or the people are going to be left hanging just like I am with damages over $57,000. And uh, also, <clears throat> you're going to have a canoe ramp next to me. What is there going to be, uh, or how are you going to uh, address the privacy for me? Or should I just put a hot dog stand out there? So bait? Going to make, make my uh, property commercial? How are you going to address that? Going to put a wall up? We, we do have an extensive landscaping plan for that area in between the... What kind? Bridge. What kind? Yeah, what kind? You're going to put a, a berm? Is that what you're going to do? No, it's, it's, it's just planting. It is native it's Florida It's going to be ground level. No. No, it's going to be trees and shrubs to, protect, to have a buffer between the bridge and your home. How high are these trees that you're talking about? I don't have the landscape plans in front of me, but um, they're, they're, they're trees. So basically, they're, they're I'm not, not, shrubs. Basically, not. I'm not going to have any privacy. Well, let, I mean, let's not litigate the case right here. Uh, staff, could you please work with, with our resident on, on the landscape plan and Absolutely. look at possibilities? Yeah, Thank and you. there's also, you know, the issue, Mayor, you're talking about with policy. So we will look at all those items. But that's where we should sit down and, and go through the plan together and, and work out a solution. I'd like to work out a solution on fixing my house. Now the, the, I'm dealing with the constructors, uh, constructions uh, insurance company, and they're not. They offer me ten grand with their appraiser. My appraiser comes in at over over sixty thousand. So that's probably not something we'd want to dis discuss uh, in this forum. But staff, can someone? Someone from the project team follow up with him? Does the city take any kind of responsibility? I mean, I can tell you personally that after you and I met in BJ's, right. don't tell anyone <laughs> that it was in Jensen Beach, that uh, I asked the city attorney to visit your house personally. So if he hasn't done that, I'll follow no. up with him. Nobody's come yeah. to the house. Yeah. But we're not going to be able to solve it here. I can't get involved as an elected official. That. It's got to be the, the staff. I would love to meet with whoever for my privacy and for my damage. All right, and you're please. welcome. You're welcome to come over to the house. I'll show you. Okay, please recognize that the damage you talked about was during the demolition of the right of way. Right. Uh, we can't speak for that. I'm I'm sure the city will follow through. But I'd like to give you an idea of the program we're gonna uh, embark on for the neighborhood for our construction impacts and that is several, threefold first thing we're doing if they haven't visited you yet we're going door to door they already did and that was very good they took pictures all around my house and i commend you on that i wish they would have done that in the beginning understood uh, i could just speak for my role i apologize for that but we will be documenting the conditions of your home we also will be providing some seismic uh, uh, measuring devices to make sure that our vibration and uh, the levels are acceptable. If, in fact, you have any claim of damage that we could prove valid, we, the project team, will assist you in chasing his insurance company. That's our job, and that we'll take that role since we'll have a pre-existing survey of your property, since we'll have data gathered from the seismic information and he has a contractual obligation 
to be liable for those damages. We'd like to think we'll prevent them, but if we don't, we'll make sure that you're treated fairly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, though, Patricia, the team will follow up with the customer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Randy. Thank you, Patricia. You got the address on that? Yes, sir. We have your address. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. That's all the speaker cards we have for tonight. We really appreciate you attending. Thank, thank you, everybody. You.